The purpose of this week's lecture is twofold. First of all, we are going to be talking about the historical thought of Frederick Jackson Turner. And in doing so, we are going to be sort of building on some of the earlier ideas that we talked about in terms of the history profession in the late 19th century, uh, particularly the major strains that were running through historical research during this time, and how Frederick Jackson Turner essentially um, turns things around and points the history, the study of history in a new direction. Secondly, we are going to be looking, obviously you can see the, the second part of this title, Frederick Jackson Turner's Long Shadow, refers to the legacy of this historian. And to do so, we're going to talk about how his singular idea put forth in his 1893 speech, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, really has a long life. It extends, I mean, you could argue that obviously we're still talking about here in 2024, but nonetheless it extends decades, if not more than a century. And to that end, we are going to be looking at one individual in particular who takes Frederick Jackson Turner's so-called frontier thesis and uses it as sort of a cudgel, if you will, against the United States, um, where we see by the mid 20th century, this historian, William Appleman Williams, basically arguing that um, Frederick Jackson Turner's historical theory um, actually is useful as a descriptor of U.S. foreign policy throughout much of the 20th century, and even earlier for that matter, as we'll see. Until Frederick Jackson Turner broached the subject in his address, and the address that we're talking about here is, of course, the one that you're reading for this week, one of the most famous statements ever made by a U.S. historian, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, which was a speech given by Frederick Jackson Turner at the annual meeting of the American Historical Association in 1893 in Chicago. Now, if you remember, I talked about in passing in one of the earlier lecture, lectures about the American Historical Association, the AHA as it's known as. This was sort of the, the early years of this organization, which showed the strength of professional history, history during this time. Um, it now had its own organization. So nonetheless, it's the kind of the top thing, if you will, in the history field. And here's this guy, Frederick Jackson Turner. He's giving this speech. And in doing so, he is, again, basically broaching a new topic. And what I mean by that is up until this point, most U.S. historians focused on the nation's roots in the East, particularly with the arrival of the Puritans in the 17th century in the Massachusetts Bay colonies and the Chesapeake Bay region. Now, prior to Turner, the sort of history that emerged in U.S. universities told this story, again, beginning with the Puritans in the East, as a story of American progress. Basically, history was progressing and along with it, America was. History was presented as a continuous process of development, the end product of which was American democracy. Now, in telling this story, these early historians, pre-1890s I'm talking about here, these early historians were very much telling a national history. And as a result, they were dismissive, for the most part, of local or sectional histories. Turner, however, claimed that it was in the West, not the East, and not with the Puritans, but rather in the West, where Americans truly transitioned, pioneers in the West truly transitioned from a European peasant into an American Democrat. It was along the frontier, Frederick Jackson Turner argued, it was along the frontier that the pioneer settler, forced to endure much struggle without any outside support, he had to do it with his own bare hands, if you will, very independently, without any sort of support. They, he had to basically become a Republican. So in many ways, in many ways, what we are seeing here is a move towards local and sectional histories, showing the importance of these areas to American progress. Because leave no doubt about it, Frederick Jackson Turner was not against the notion of American progress. He was a big advocate of it but rather he was trying to add another wrinkle to the story. And to do that, he focused again, not on the eastern seaboard, but rather on the west. Now, in many ways, Frederick Jackson Turner was influenced by his father, a guy by the name of Andrew Jackson Turner. 
The Elder Turner had edited the weekly Wisconsin State Register, which is located in Portage, Wisconsin, which is a relatively small t city in central Wisconsin. Now, when the Elder Turner was editing this weekly, it was not a huge newspaper, obviously. It was a small town newspaper. So therefore, this gave him a lot of time to also focus on other issues. And what he found an interest in was local history and local politics. So undoubtedly, Frederick Jackson Turner, as a young child and a young man, saw what his father was doing here with his focus and interest on this relatively small area here in Wisconsin. This most definitely had an influence on Frederick Jackson Turner's realization that yes, in fact, important things did happen in these sort of rural areas out in the middle of nowhere. So nonetheless, to get back to Frederick Jackson Turner, we would actually see him stay in the state of Wisconsin for his bachelor's degree, for his undergraduate degree. He would obtain that at the University of Wisconsin, and he would eventually then leave to go to the East Coast, Baltimore in particular, to get his PhD at John Hopkins University. Uh, now, John's, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner would not stay away from the state of Wisconsin from long because what we are going to see is he would actually return to teach at the University of Wisconsin in the history department in 1889. Now, in addition to this move away from national histories to local and sectional histories, another important aspect of Frederick Jackson Turner's thought was also his involvement with something that we're actually going to talk about in a lot more detail next week when we talk about uh, Charles Beard in particular. Um, but it's this idea of a new history and a new focus because not only is Frederick Jackson Turner notable for changing the sort of geographical lens, again moving away from the east to the west, but he is also significant in terms of focusing not so much on elite political actors but also looking at common ordinary folk, i.e. the pioneer that we talked about earlier. Because in looking at these pioneers, Turner was obviously focusing less on leaders and the political institutions that appeared in new settlements and more on social and economic history from below. As he wrote in Problems in American History in 1892, behind institutions, behind constitutional forms, lie the vital forces that call these organs into life and shape them to meet changing conditions. In short, if you truly want to understand history, you have to move beyond the buildings and the government that is in these areas to the actual people that created them, what Frederick Jackson Turner called the, quote, vital forces. And in fact, these vital forces were, of course, no longer just the politicians and the elites, but rather ordinary settlers. It was these ordinary settlers where the concept of democracy and republicanism that's where it came about, not these politicians and elites. So therefore, in focusing on these sort of vital source forces, these ordinary pioneers, we see Frederick Jackson Turner moving away from Ronke's political history. Remember, we talked about Ronke earlier in the semester with his scientific history and how that in turn led to a, a focus on politicians and the government because those are the places where and people who had their sources in libraries and universities where historians could access them. Common ordinary people, it was a lot harder to find out about them. So for instance, Frederick Jackson Turner, when he looked at what was going on in the West in that article, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, he would look to other sources, uh, including the U.S. Census Count. Uh, which would help him make an, some several claims in his article. But nonetheless, Turner's focus on this less tangible, less documented vital force, to use his words again, brought about some controversy, uh, particularly among the, the sort of bigwigs of the historical profession. So for instance, a guy by the name of J. Franklin Jameson, uh, J. Franklin Jameson was a founder of the AHA, the American Historical Association. He claimed that Turner's focus on such historical figures threatened ob objectivity. In social history, he warned Turner in a letter, quote, you do not have definitely limited bodies of materials handed down by authority, like statutes or other manageable series, 
but a vast blot of miscellaneous material from which the historian picks out what he wants, and so the effort to document must often be a process of selection. And if selection always opens to the suspicion of being a biased selection or one made up to sustain a set of views. Now here's the thing. Um, we see uh, uh, some blinders on this guy, J. Franklin Jameson, because his argument is essentially that with these varied sources that are at the disposal of a historian who's studying ordinary folk, the pioneers, that the historian can then kind of pick and choose what sources he used because they're not all in one area, in one institution, in one archive. This is kind of missing the point that really any historian could do this. Any historian can select and choose different documents, um, cherry pick what he or she wants to look at to further their argument. So really, this is sort of uh, a non-starter in terms of debate about whether social history can be objective because it ignores the fact that, again, what Jameson is saying here could take place among the so-called scientific historians who rely on documents in archives from governments and politicians. I want to turn now to that document that you're reading for this week, one of the documents that you're reading for, in the speech that I referred to earlier from the 1893 AHA convention, the significance of the frontier in American history. Because this doc, this speech, this document, is about an important event that took place three years earlier. And what I'm referring to here is what Turner bemoans in his 1893 article, and that is the 1890 census report. It was in this report from 1890 in which the superintendent of the U.S. Census Bureau announced that the rapid settlement of the West meant, ba meant that by 1890, quote, there can hardly be said to be a frontier line. So essentially, what this Census Bureau chief was saying is so many settlers have moved out west by 1890 that there is no empty land out there. It is all inhabited by people, so therefore there no longer is a frontier. The frontier is now gone. Well, not surprisingly, as you'll see when reading this document from 1893 from Frederick Jackson Turner, this was something of concern. As Turner wrote, quote, and now, four centuries from the discovery of America, at the end of a hundred years of life under the Constitution, the frontier is gone, and with it, and with its going, has closed the first period of American history. So now the question became, was American progress done? Had America progressed as good as it could, and it was now over? Because remember, at the end of the day, Frederick Jackson Turner, although he looked at a different place than earlier historians for where this progress occurred, he was still very much of the mindset that America was great and that America was progressing. And in fact, it had sort of reached its pinnacle or its high point, at least up until that moment in time, here in the West. And now to say that there is no longer any possible movement westward, what did that mean? Because the question essentially came, became, so what? What does that mean? Does it mean, in fact, the end of American democracy? Does it mean that? So clearly, left unsaid in all of this, at least in the 1893 document that you're reading, was whether Turner believed that this, in fact, was a new period of American history that would lead to the collapse of America's democratic institutions. Nonetheless, um, I'm going to help you think about this a little bit. And the way I, we're going to do so is actually look at a document that you did not have to read for this week. And that was something written three years after the significance of the frontier in American history. An article published by Frederick, Frederick Jackson Turner in the Atlantic Monthly. And here's what he wrote in this article. He said the following, quote, for nearly three centuries, the dominant fact in American life has been expansion. With the settlement of the Pacific coast and occupation of the free lands, this movement has come to a check. That these energies of expansion will no longer operate would be a rash prediction. And the demands for a vigorous foreign policy for the interoceanic canal for a revival of our power upon the seas and for the extension of American influence to outlying islands and adjoining countries are indications that the movement will continue. This is a long quote, 
but I want to break it down here because this is extremely, extremely important to understanding what Frederick Jackson Turner was all about, how he believed history could be used by this country to its benefit. So first of all, he is clearly saying here that American progress in the past 300 years has hinged on expansion. That's his major point here. But now he also expresses again what he talked about three years earlier. And that was the fact that now this movement has come to, in his words, a quote, check. The Pacific coast is now filled. The frontier is gone. There are no longer free lands. So what he says, though, the next point is extremely important. He says, that these energies of expansion will no longer operate, he describes this as a RAS prediction. There's no way that Americans will stop. Just because the frontier is closed, America has too much expansive energy to stop there. So this is where we get to the final point where we really see proof that in fact, Frederick Jackson Turner was sort of kind of an imperialist. He says the following. He talks about the need for a vigorous foreign policy. What did this include? Well, first of all, an, inter an interoceanic canal. Some of you have probably heard of the Panama Canal. There was a lot of talk during this time in the 1890s about the need for a canal that will come to fruition to allow for easy movement between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Also, he talks about a revival of our power upon the seas. In my US history class, I talked about a guy by the name of Mahan, M-A-H-A-N. Mahan was a very prominent intellectual, a military strategist during the 1890s, and he would talk repeatedly about the need for the United States to match what Britain had done in terms of its naval power. Because according to Mahan, this guy Mahan, America needed a strong navy to protect its shipping interest abroad and basically ensure that there was an American market for goods abroad. He also did Frederick Jackson Turner talked about the extension of American influence to outline islands and adjoining countries. This is basically the idea that America, in one form or another, needs to take over certain islands and the adjoining countries. So clearly what we are seeing here again is the idea that expansion was a good thing, the border and the frontier are now reached, but that does not mean that expansion has to end. We can move beyond America's borders. Someone who saw this imperialist mentality in Frederick Jackson Turner would be William Appleman Williams, the individual that we see here on the right, who I describe as Turner's revisionist nemesis. So if Turner did not deal, at least in his 1893 speech that you're reading, with this issue entirely, other historians no doubt reached conclusions in the decades after Turner's death. Most notable among these was William Appleman Williams. Ironically, Williams himself was a product of the University of Wisconsin, earning his PhD at the university in 1950. During his time in the history program, Williams taught, was taught by practitioners of the so-called Wisconsin School of Diplomatic History, which challenged long-standing assumptions about America's relations with the rest of the world. Basically, the idea was, here in the mid-20th century, that America was not so innocent. America was not so benevolent. But rather, America shared a lot of characteristics with the European nations that had been involved in colonialism and imperialism prior, like Great Britain and France. So Williams really imbued such thinking as evidenced by how he described, quote, empire as a way of life for Americans. Williams also, besides growing up, at least in terms of his intellect, here in this Wisconsin School of Diplomatic History, Williams also belonged to a group of revisionist historians who challenged the way that Americans saw themselves and their country. Rather than portray the United States as a benevolent nation intent on promoting capitalist, egalitarian, and republican ideals, revisionist historians accused the nation of holding long-standing imperial ambitions and capitalist domination. One of the most prominent individuals in this revisionist schools um, was a guy by the name of Gar Elpervitz. Uh, he wrote a book about why the United States dropped the atomic bomb during World War II, arguing that it was not done to defeat the Japanese, 
but rather as a warning signal to the Soviet Union that the Soviet Union should stand down after World War II, the United States was a big dog, and they should be allowed to control their yard, which in this case was the world. But nonetheless, this is the kind of thinking that, again, imbues the, the, the mindset of William Appleman Williams as he's thinking about Turner's ideas. So let's see how these two things are then connected. Williams' historical mindset and how it relates to Jackson's frontier thesis. So to do this, we're actually going to start with a historical event that William Appleman Williams used to sort of attack Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. And this historical event was the Open Door Notes. The Open Door Notes were issued by Secretary of State of the United States, John Hay, in 1898. And these were paramount to Williams' interpretation of history, again, particularly Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. In these notes, Hay turned his attention to the scramble of markets among European nations in Asia, but also other less developed nations. In short, what was happening here in the 1890s is you had a lot of European countries, France, Great Britain, highest among them, basically demanding that these less developed nations, China among others, open up their countries to foreign economic domination. Now, the only problem was, the only problem was, of course, that this meant that the strongest would prevail. And therefore, what we are gonna see is in his 1898 diplomatic statement, Hay declared that China should not be carved up by powerful European nations, but rather open its borders to all nations interested in trading with the country. This again was very much because the United States at this point was a, a relatively young and weak nation here. So therefore, with this open door notes, John Hay was hoping that the United States would not be pushed out by these bigger, stronger nations. Well, Williams took these notes and tied them to Turner's thesis about the closing of the frontier. Williams attempted to show in his writings how America resolved the problem of a closing frontier by simply moving beyond its borders, essentially extending its borders across the globe through the creation of new markets to sell its goods, which prevented the United States from having to deal with these internal disruptions that might otherwise possibly lead to the destruction of its Republican ideals. In other words, the domestic political health of democracy depended on the possibility of expansion abroad for Williams. When we can see this clear as day as something Williams wrote later in his life in 1971, quote, this definition of the frontier as both a gate of escape from evil and an open door to prosperity and democracy is much more central to America's difficulties of perspective than the gospel of progress. In short, America is escaping evil and bringing about prosperity and democracy in this country by expanding abroad. Now, from William Appleman Williams' perspective, that was false because what American expansion was essentially doing was destroying the same democratic ideals that it was purportedly strengthening by going abroad. But nonetheless, I want to end here with just a note in general about how this debate that we're seeing between William Appleman Williams in the mid 20th century and Frederick Jackson Turner, who lived much earlier in the late 19th century and early 20th century, shows what historiography is all about. These two historians debating a topic, not face to face and personally, but rather in their writings. And that's what historiography is, this conversation that takes place across time among and between historians.